This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, the world. This is They Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I'm Sadie Eck. And I'm Courtney Eck. We're your hosts, and we are sisters, and we are going to talk to you today about some murder. Sure are. Uh, that's what we do every yeah. once in a while. Twice, yeah, <laughs> twice a week specifically. <laughs> um, I'm going to let Courtney jump into it. I don't have any idea what's going on today. Don't know well, what what's about. Go- going on today is that nobody wins, so strap in and prepare yourself to say oh god oh no oh god over and over because okay. that's it's <laughs> a rough one you guys uh, uh i also want to say ahead of time that there's some kind of like murder bird in my neighborhood that's just screaming bloody murder so i apologize <laughs> i closed all the doors and windows but if you hear screaming in the background it's a bird <laughs> there also is just some sort of chipmunk feud right before we started uh-huh. recording so real wild times out in <laughs> Northwest Indiana. <laughs> anyway, I am going to tell you the story today about the torture and murder of Shonda Scherer. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I want to give a major trigger warning ahead of time for serious sexual assault and violence against children. This is a brutal one. I will try to spare you some details, but some details cannot be spared. So if those things are bothersome to you, I don't blame you. Uh, This is not a good episode for you to listen to. To the rest of you, here we go. I also want to give a shout out real quick to our friend Rebecca. This was her recommendation. She sent it to us. I guess she's got a calendar of lesser known heinous crimes or something along those lines. (laughs) Of course she does. (laughs) I know, which I support and (laughs) like to subscribe to. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. To us. Yes. And she sent it to us, was like, have you ever heard of this? And we had not, um, which is odd because it takes place in Indiana around the time that we were kids and it's fucking insane. So I don't know how none of us have ever heard of this one, but here you go. Shonda Scherer was born in Pineville, Kentucky on June 6th, 1979 to Stephen and Jacqueline Scherer. Shanda moved with her mother to New Albany, Indiana in 1991, where she attended school and played on the basketball team and was very involved in school activities. Shonda was popular, athletic, beautiful, and described as, quote, your typical American 12-year-old. A few days into the school year, a classmate in school asked Shanda to break up with her boyfriend for her, and Shonda agreed. She broke the news to the boy, he didn't take it well, and he proceeded to start a fight with the poor messenger. Remember how you do that in high school, in junior high? Be like, go break mm-hmm. up with my boyfriend for me. <laughs> yep. So they took advantage of the new girl, and what resulted was a big fight which escalated, and the boy's cousin, 15-year-old Amanda Heverin, got involved. Shonda and Amanda engaged in a full-blown fight in the hallway. Both received a week's detention. We're talking like punches, like physical fight? Full-blown fight. Full-blown, okay. yep, physical fight. During the week in detention, a bond actually formed between the two, and over the next few weeks, the two started falling for each other. Mm, sort of like... Uh breakfast club yeah style. that yeah except um <laughs> 12 year olds and 15 year olds and awfulness beyond your wildest okay. imagination all right yep. what shonda didn't know was that amanda already had a relationship brewing with another classmate melinda loveless melinda was less than thrilled by amanda's relationship with their younger peer and started to formulate ways to get revenge on shonda in the meantime shonda's mother found a letter from amanda that was clearly a love letter and Shonda's mother was disturbed by the relationship, partly because the the girl, Amanda, was older, but also because it was the 90s, and they weren't down with the gay back then, mm-hmm. speaking from experience, especially in Indiana. Right. She decided to withdraw Shonda from public school and enrolled her in a Catholic private school to keep her away from her new love. Shonda did move on to some extent. She started dating boys and making new friends in her new school, but she remained close to Amanda, and so Melinda's jealousy grew. In the fall of 1991, Melinda made a new friend, 17-year-old Mary Lorene Tackett, who went by Lori. 
Lori came from an extremely religious family, and Melinda and Lori quickly realized that they shared a mutual darkness. Lori was once quoted as saying that one of the greatest feelings of power that she thought she could ever experience was to take someone's life. So who were Melinda and Lori? Melinda Lovelace was born in New Albany, Indiana on October 28, 1975, and was the youngest of three girls. Her parents were Marjorie and Larry Lovelace, and Larry was a Vietnam War vet who was treated like a hero when he returned home from war. At home, however, Larry was nothing short of a total monster. Mm. He struggled to keep a job, but when he and his wife were able to both work, they lived comfortably in an upper-middle-class suburb. Larry had a spending addiction and eventually filed for bankruptcy, and extended family said that the girls were often hungry and underfed when they visited. His wife Marjorie described Larry as a serious sexual deviant who would wear she and her daughter's underwear and makeup and was preoccupied with watching her have sex with other men and women. Mm-mm. Mm-hmm. And I want to be very clear. Mm-hmm. I have don't think there's anything wrong with men wearing women's no. underwear or makeup or watching their spouse have sex with other people if it's consensual, but those acts were not consensual. Reports said Larry would embarrass his girls by finding their underwear and smelling it in front of family members, <sighs> and that he was very emotionally and verbally abusive to his daughters. once firing a gun at Michelle, who was Melinda's sister, when she was seven, but intentionally missing her. Oh, God. Yeah. It gets better. Well, you think about, like, the underwear underwear sniffing. Yes! Uh, Like like how vulnerable you felt as a teen or a preteen. Yeah. Like, everything was embarrassing. Yes. Your parents looked at you wrong, and it was embarrassing. Yes. That no, was, was monstrous. This just, oh, God. Yeah, it's so humiliating. That makes me sick to my stomach. Yeah, it's fucking awful. Even to do that behind closed doors is extremely yeah. humiliating and abusive, but then to yeah. do it in front of other people, it's just uh, like... I can't even imagine. Nope. Marjorie and Larry would often go to bars to pick up people to swing with, and Marjorie reported that he would, quote, share her with his coworkers, which she hated. Ugh. Marjorie became extremely depressed and began to attempt suicide once during an orgy with another couple, during an orgy with another couple. (laughs) I didn't, I couldn't find the details on that, but multiple sources reported that. And once after Larry arranged for Marjorie to be gang raped. After the gang rape, Marjorie withheld sex for a month and Larry eventually raped her while his daughters were home and could hear the incident. You were not lying, man. No, I'm it, I, I'm just getting started. Just oh, a warning. Yeah. In 1986, she refused to let him go home with two women at a bar, so he beat her so severely that she was hospitalized and he was convicted of battery. When Melinda was five, her parents gave up drinking briefly, started attending a Baptist church, and Larry became a lay minister and marriage counselor for oh, the church. God. Which just... <laughs> Like, yeah. just a quick PSA that just because somebody says that they're a religious person doesn't mean that they're a good person and doesn't mean that they are qualified to give you marriage counseling. No, he should go hang out with Jeffrey Lundgren. Seriously. At one point, Melinda was sent to a hotel room. Melinda, the daughter, was sent to a hotel room with a 50-year-old man for a five-hour, quote, exorcism. No. And I couldn't find any details on that either. But even if it was a five-hour actual exorcism, what the fuck? What the fuck? The family left the church two years later when a woman accused Larry of attempting to rape her. Oh, my God. Uh... There were various accounts by Larry's daughters and their cousin Teddy that he molested them. And Melinda slept in the same bed as Larry until he abandoned them when she was 14. Mm. Larry left the family in 1990 after an incident where his wife caught him spying on Melinda and a friend and attacked him with a knife. Oh, my God. Yeah. He was sent to the hospital after attempting to grab the knife in the attack, and Marjorie attempted suicide again after the run-in. Wow. Larry then moved to Florida, remarried, and eventually cut off all communication with Melinda, which crushed her. Mm. And so these are just things that came out in testimony, too, during the later trial. So God only knows what 
else went on behind closed doors. I mean, just one of those, it's just your dad sniffing your panties in front of you or your family members is probably enough to make you lose your fucking mind, right? Oh, man. No. No. So, Lori was born in Madison, Indiana in 1974. Her mother was a very conservative Pentecostal, and her father was a factory worker who had a couple felony convictions. Lori claimed she was molested when she was five and again when she was 12, and also claimed that her mother tried to strangle her after catching her changing into jeans at school. (laughs) Which, if anybody knows anything about (laughs) Pentecostal religion, certain sects of the religion require that women keep their hair long and their skirts and wear long skirts. They're not allowed to wear pants or jeans, so... She was trying to be cool, trying to wear jeans at school, and got strangled as a result. Oh, my God. Lori became preoccupied with the occult as she got older, and her mother once stormed over to a friend's house after finding out that her father had purchased a Ouija board for them to play with, so the friend's father. (laughs) (laughs) She demanded that they burn the board and exercise their home, which, Sadie and I have a lot of stories about playing with the Ouija board. (laughs) And I would, based on several, many, many decades of experience with Ouija boards, I would recommend you exercise your home if you play with one inside. So I don't think she was that far (laughs) off. I've had some spooky shit happen. Mm -hmm. I don't don't touch the things. Nope. Lori would entertain her friends by pretending to be possessed by the spirit of, quote, Deanna the Vampire, (laughs) which is such a specific, (laughs) adorable name for a vampire. It's not like... It's like uh, Stuart the dog or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jennifer the vampire. And began to cut herself after dating a girl in 1991 who introduced her to self-harm. No. Her parents admitted her to a hospital when they found out she was hurting herself and she was prescribed medication and released. Two days later, she cut her wrists deeply while hanging out with friends and she was then admitted to a psychiatric hospital. She'd admitted that she'd been experiencing hallucinations for years and was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. She was eventually released and dropped out of school soon after. Melinda and Lori became very close, and Melinda expressed her desire to get revenge on Shonda for stealing Amanda's attention. The two began to spend most of their time plotting ways to seek that revenge. On January 11th, 1992, Lori borrowed her father's car to pick up two friends after school. The two friends were 15-year-old Hope Rippey and 15-year-old Tony Lawrence. The girls had plans to go to an indoor skate park where bands would play later that night to have fun and flirt with boys. The three drove to a nearby town to meet up with Melinda, and Melinda convinced the other girls to go with her to harass and intimidate Shonda. They concealed Melinda under a blanket in the back of the car, and two of the girls went up to the house to lure Shonda out by claiming Amanda was at the mall and wanted to see her. So Amanda, obviously being the object of everyone's affection. Right. Shonda wanted to go, but it was getting late, and her father didn't know the two other girls, so he wouldn't let her leave uh, to go with them. She told the girls to come back after midnight, and she would sneak out to meet them at that point. Oh, God. Yeah. She's 12. Let's just oh remember. God. She's 12 years old. The girls then went to the skate park to hang out for a bit and returned to Shonda's around 1230 that night. Shonda then sneaked out and joined the girls in the car, and after they started driving, Melinda popped out from under the blanket in the back and held a knife to Shonda's neck from behind. While they drove, Melinda interrogated Shonda about her sexual relationship with Amanda. They drove Shonda to a teen hangout called, quote, the Witch's Castle, which carried the legend that nine witches had lived there before it was burnt down to drive them out. Mm. One thing that strikes me throughout this whole story is just how juvenile so much of this is. So right. it's like these really intense adult sort of behaviors, like having these homosexual relationships with each other and holding each other at knife point, and, you know, like doing these really crazy things. But then also like, let's take her to the witch's castle, you know, <laughs> it's just yeah. like where the kids hang out to spook each other out. Yeah. At the witch's castle, they tied up her hands and feet and threatened her, saying things like she had pretty hair, and they wondered how pretty she'd look if they cut it all off. They took Shonda's rings and shared them between themselves, and at one point, Hope took her Mickey Mouse watch and danced to the tune it played. 
Lori told Shonda that the witch's house was filled with human remains and hers would be joining them soon. They then attempted to set a t-shirt on fire to threaten her with, but the girls became spooked that someone would spot the fire, and so they brought Shonda back to the car and left. They then drove to an isolated garbage dump where Hope and Tony stayed in the car while Melinda and Lori led Shonda into the darkness. They forced Shonda to strip naked, and then Melinda beat her with her fists and slammed her face into her knees several times, which cut Shonda's mouth on her own braces. She then tried to cut Shonda's throat, but the knife was too dull, so Melinda and Lori took turns stabbing her in the chest. Oh, God. They then strangled her with a rope until she was unconscious, and thinking she was dead, they put her body in the trunk of the car. The four girls then drove to Lori's house, where they chatted about what had happened and what they were going to do with a dead girl in the trunk of the car. As they were talking and drinking soda, some dogs began barking, and they discovered Shonda was still alive in the trunk. Oh my God. According to Wikipedia, Lori went outside to stab Shonda several times with a paring knife, then washed up and proceeded to read the other girls' futures with rune stones. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's about 2.30 in the morning at this point, too. Hope and Tony decided they didn't want to have anything more to do with the plan, and rather than going for help at that point to save Shonda's life, they stayed behind while the other two headed back out to complete the awful events that would follow. Melinda and Lori drove around for several more hours, stopping only to beat and anally penetrate Shonda with a tire iron when she began to cry and make gurgling noises from inside the trunk. Oh my god. According to reports, after beating Shonda, Lori put the tire iron in Melinda's face and told her to, quote, smell it. Mm. They then drove back to Lori's house, where they laughed while telling the other girls of the torture, and the laughing and conversation woke Lori's mother, who was mad that they were there and demanded that they leave. The girls then drove to a gas station where they bought a two liter of Pepsi, poured out the Pepsi, and then filled the bottle with gas. They then drove Shonda out to a country road and dragged her body wrapped in a blanket out of the trunk into the side of the road. They poured gas on Shonda's body and lit her on fire. They then left for a bit to let Shonda burn, and when they returned, they were disappointed that the body hadn't burned completely. Melinda brought more gas over to douse her again and saw that Shonda was still moving. No. She was still alive. No. Melinda poured more gas on her, set her on fire again, and then the girls left to get breakfast together at McDonald's, where they joked about Shonda's body looking like one of the sausages that they were eating. They dropped off Hope and Tony, then returned to Melinda's home, where they called Amanda to tell her they'd killed Shonda and arranged to meet her later that day. Another friend named Crystal also came over around the time Amanda showed up, and the girls told them about what they'd done to Shonda the night before. The girls were reluctant to believe them, so they showed them the blood and Shonda's bloody handprints still in the trunk. Jesus Christ. I know. Amanda was horrified and asked to be driven home, where Melinda kissed her told her she loved her, and asked her not to tell anyone. Amanda agreed. Mm. So there's tons of footage of these girls, tons of news footage. There's also, like, more current interviews with them. They could not look more normal and unassuming. It's kind of shocking Mm -hmm. how they don't, you know, it's not like West Memphis 3 where you're like, oh, yeah, maybe they are Satan worshipers or whatever. Like, these (laughs) girls are just pretty teenagers you know like nothing about them says that they're gonna do something like that to a little girl which is so horrifying a couple of hours later around 10 a.m two hunters found shonda's burnt body the state police were brought in to investigate and a quick weird side note one of the officers who was first to arrive on the scene was later acquitted of killing his own family oh jesus so i don't know what the fuck was going on in new albany indiana in the 80s but (laughs) Look out, (laughs) right? Uh, They initially thought Shonda was 21, and the crime must have been a result of a drug deal gone wrong because the injuries were so horrific. Mm. So Shonda's father realized she was missing early in the morning, and he and Shonda's mother filed a missing persons report around 1.45 p.m. Her parents were divorced at this point, too, so she was staying with her father at the time. Around 8.20 p.m., police caught an early break when Hope and Tony couldn't keep the crime to themselves and told their parents what had happened. Good. 
Yeah, I know. I mean, too bad they didn't tell sooner. But... Right. You know, when yeah. Shonda was still She's alive. Still and for had hours ch- and hours. Yeah. And they, I mean, it was like 10 and a half hours that they Ugh. tortured I just, her. I, I'm not okay with that. No. No. And it's like, we've dealt with these cases before and I've, and I totally understand how you get each other all hyped up like teenagers, you know, you just get caught up in this thing, but right. how the fuck does that happen? Yeah. You know? No. I and we know. also talked about the psychopath, apath, empath, mm-hmm. you know, triangle yeah. and about how easily apaths are persuaded to do things. But for 10 and a half hours, they did it. And these girls got fully on board with this just being like a hilarious teenage joke that they were pulling. It's just it's like so crazy beyond beyond comprehension. Yep. Yep. And the the episode, just for other people, if you haven't listened, is the thrill kill of Daniel Sorensen. Thank you. Yes. Courtney's talking about. Yeah. So go listen if you want to know more. Yeah. It's sort of a similar case, kind mm-hmm. of weirdly less horrifying because of the age of the kids and sort of the circumstances but i think that yeah daniel's death happened a lot quicker you know so there's absolutely yeah absolutely so hope's parents started by consulting a lawyer while tony's parents quickly brought her down to the police station so tony outlined the basic events of the night but claimed she didn't have anything to do with the violence and that she tried to convince her friends to bring shonda home when things escalated which was not accurate. Mm -hmm. She claimed that she and Hope had very little to do with the night's events and only went along with the plan because they were scared of Lori and Melinda. The other three girls were immediately arrested after Hope's confession. Good. Yes. And so I'm assuming there probably was a certain amount of fear involved or just overwhelmed feelings. Like I remember hanging out with my naughtier friends. Yeah. And like finding myself in late night situations that I was not comfortable with and didn't really know how to get out of, but nothing fucking nowhere near anything like that. Well, and it sounds like those two had opportunities. Like they weren't all together the whole night. Mm-hmm. So they could have when correct, they, they, you know, Lori and Melinda left, they could have told somebody then. Well, and they were gone for hours. Like they didn't yeah. just leave for 30 minutes. Like they drove around for hours torturing her further. Right. Originally, Melinda and Lori planned to fight the charges, but then agreed to plead guilty when the prosecutor put the death penalty on the table, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, justified, but these girls were 17 years old. Right. All four girls were tried as adults, and each defense focused on their histories of abuse and mental illness as factors leading to their decisions to torture and murder Shonda. In exchange for her cooperation... Tony Lawrence was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years for one count of criminal confinement and was released on December 14, 2000, after serving nine years. Hope Rippey was sentenced to 60 years with 10 years suspended for mitigating circumstances, plus 10 years of medium supervision probation. She was released on April 28, 2006, after serving 14 years of her sentence. Wow. Melinda and Lori were both sentenced to 60 years, and Lori was released from Rockville Correctional Institution on January 11, 2018, which was the 26th anniversary of Shonda's murder. You're kidding me. Nope. Our parents volunteered at Rockville, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah. I meant to text mom and see if she knew Lori. I'll, hey. do, I'll do that later, because, yeah, she would have been in there around the time that they volunteered. Yeah. Wow. I know. Melinda was released on September 5th, 2019, after serving 26 and a half years. You are kidding me. No. How did they get out? Because they were kids, man. They I'm were s- sentenced to 60 years. Yeah. Maybe but, you know, that good and... behavior and, yep, all of the things. Oh, yeah. After so much abuse was revealed in Melinda's testimony, her father, Larry, was arrested in 1993 on charges of rape, sodomy, and sexual battery. Good. He I remained... can't believe he wasn't arrested before then or like, like he did all that terrible shit and yep. before. And well, he arrested. was arrested for battery. That was the only thing when that he beat, it. yep, when he beat okay. her mom. Um, but I don't think he was in for very long for that, obviously. Um, but check this out. Check out this awesome information. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> he remained in jail for two years while waiting for trial. And by the time his trial occurred, they had to drop all charges except for sexual battery because the statute of limitations had run out. You're fucking kidding me. How is that possible? That's How not, does it not it, like pause, you know, and be like, 
if we can't get a trial, I mean, trial expediency is a big thing and I know it doesn't always happen, but you shouldn't be able to just sit in jail while your time runs out. Right. 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 It should be like you're arrested. Yes. That's, that's, that's when it starts. That's when the clock stops. Right. When you're arrested. We got him. He's charged. Right. And I'm hoping I need to do some more research about that. I'm hoping that that is the case now, but if it's not, I'm further. Well, we just need to get rid of statute of limitations. For, for rape, rape and murder, yeah, yes, a hundred percent. Well, murder, there isn't any, but right. Thank you. Yes, yeah. rape, rape, big mm-hmm. time. So he pled guilty and was sentenced to time served. A couple of weeks after his release, he attempted to sue the Floyd County Jail for thirty-nine million dollars for cruel and unusual punishment for not letting him sleep in his bed during the day and not letting him read the newspaper, among <laughs> other complaints. Oh my God! Yes. You absolute fucking piece of shit. Like, Mm -mm. I don't, the fact that people like him live among us is Mm -hmm. horrifying. Shonda's father, Stephen Scherer, died of alcoholism in 2005 at the age of 53. In an interview with Shonda Scherer's mother, Jackie Vaught, on the ID Discovery series Deadly Women, Vaught stated that Shara's father was so destroyed by his daughter's murder that he, quote, did everything he could to kill himself besides mm-hmm. put a gun to his head and that he, quote, drank himself to death. The man definitely died from a broken heart. <laughs> Which I know. Like... I'm tell like I said, nobody wins uh, in this story. God, yeah. Uh... 53. Like, just. Yeah. Uh... In January of 2009, the Shonda Share Scholarship Fund was established and planned to provide scholarships to two students per year from Prosser School of Technology in New Albany. One scholarship would go to a student who is continuing his or her education, and the other scholarship to a student who is beginning his or her career and must buy tools or other work equipment. By November of 2018, Shonda's mother stated that the scholarship fund had been depleted and no longer accepting donations. No. Yeah. I don't know how many people were actual recipients, if any. Oh, no. In 2012, Shonda's mother made her first contact with Melinda Loveless in a roundabout way by donating a dog named Angel in Shonda's name to Melinda for her to train in the Indiana Canine Assistance (laughs) Program through Project to Heal which provides service pets to people with disabilities. Melinda trained dogs for the program for several years. Shonda's mother reported that she had endured criticism over the decision, but defends it saying, quote, it's my choice to make. She's my child. If you don't let good things come from bad things, nothing gets better. And I know what my child would want. My child would want this. She stated that she hoped to donate a dog every year in honor of Shonda. (laughs) So, like, some oh. dogs got trained as a result. So that's something good. But yeah, well, I mean, the... that's a real act of compassion. Man. Yes, I'm... absolutely. I would hope that I would <sighs> rise to the place that I could do something like that to the for the person who tortured and murdered my child. Mm-hmm. Um, I commend people who can get to that place, but I also understand people who just drink themselves to death or live in seething permanent anger for, you know, what happened to them and their family. So I know I do love those programs. So I do really, really, really love that they exist in prison and that people can seek rehabilitation through those kinds of therapies. You know, I think that's a wonderful use of prison and not, you know, for profit generation of goods and services for corporations, but that's (laughs) another story. So, of course, my big question is, knowing that these women are out and knowing what they did and how fucking awful what they did was, can child psychopaths and murderers be helped? Because like, there any sort of rehabilitation for young people who do crazy shit like that? So I did a great deal of reading about the likelihood of child murderers killing again. And most of the studies that I found in- included populations in urban areas where violence is more prevalent is not premeditated outside of revenge and the child's participation in the homicide is often coerced or as an accessory. So most of the studies I found um, state that the recidivism rate is more than half. So at first I was like, I'm never going to find this information because 
you know, you're looking at these broad populations of kids, like underage people who have murdered. And a lot of the statistics include like gang related violence that results in death and things right. like that. So if you are a child in general who murders in the United States, the chances of you reoffending are like 70%. They're more than wow. half, which is a significant amount. So I dug a little deeper uh, to find cases like Melinda and Lori, where the homicidal or psychopathic actions of the child were likely as a result of a personality disorder, mm -hmm. which was either present from birth or a result of sustained abuse. And the results are very interesting. So almost everything I'm going to read from here on out is just directly quoting, just directly reading from an article called When Your Child is a Psychopath that was written by Barbara Bradley Haggerty for The Atlantic. Mm, we better read it. Just in yes, case. I would say everybody should read it. <laughs> it's fucking fascinating. She's done yeah. a lot of shoot. There's an NPR interview with her. It's fascinating shit. But right. in the article, I will refer to a six year old child called Samantha who was brought to San Marcos Treatment Center near Austin after drawing a book full of murder weapons mm. and practicing killing on her stuffed animals because, quote, I wanted the whole world to myself, she says. So I made a whole entire book about how to hurt people. Wow. Things also escalated to her attempting to strangle her two-year-old sister mm -hmm. and later her two-month-old baby brother. Oh, boy. Her mother questioned her, quote, you realize you would have killed her. She would not have been able to breathe. She would have died. Samantha said, I know. Her mother said, what about the rest of us? Samantha said, I want to kill all of you. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. It's like, did you ever watch Child of Rage? That little documentary from, I think, the 60s, where it's like a six-year-old girl who's just straight mm -hmm. up like... I'm going to, I'm going to kill every last one of you. I don't know if I have. Oh I my should. God. Yeah. It's so scary. So scary. Uh, it's on YouTube. I watched it some, somewhat recently, but the, the child of rage girl actually has been rehabilitated. And so I was fascinated to figure, wow. find that out. Yeah. But this is all, this is in line with kind of her rehabilitation. So researchers shy away from calling children psychopaths. The term carries too much stigma and too much determinism. So, you know, obviously you don't want to just label a six-year-old a psychopath because then they'll never get better. You know, right. they just they'll be pushed away, pushed outside of society forever. Well, I think that's true for a lot of diagnoses, right? Like Absolutely. Bipolar and they, they won't, they won't put a, what's it called? <laughs> Diagnosis. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> until, yeah, until they're older. Well, there's, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of development that, that needs to occur. And, right. you know, you don't want to just assume that these things aren't just behaviors that they're acting out as they're developing right. and sort of understanding boundaries and things like that. Mm -hmm. So they prefer to describe children like Samantha as having, quote, callous and unemotional traits, shorthand for a cluster of characteristics and behaviors, including lack of empathy, remorse, or guilt, shallow emotions, aggression, and even cruelty, and a seeming indifference to punishment. Callous and unemotional children have no trouble hurting others to get what they want. If they do seem caring or empathetic, they're probably trying to manipulate you. Researchers believe that nearly 1% of children exhibit these traits, about as many as have autism or bipolar disorder. Wow. Which is fucking terrifying. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. Until recently, the condition was seldom mentioned. Only in 2013 did the American Psychiatric Association include callous and unemotional traits in its diagnostic manual, the DSM-5. The condition can go unnoticed because many children with these traits, who can be charming and smart enough to mimic social cues, are able to mask them. As a child gets older, more obvious warning signs appear. Kent Keel, a psychologist at the University of New Mexico and the author of The Psychopath Whisperer, says that one scary harbinger occurs when a kid who is 8, 9, or 10 years old commits a transgression or a crime while alone without the pressure of peers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> of course we think about like Hope and Tony in this case or kids in other cases where they weren't necessarily the ringleader. Right. So these kids are troubled or have sort of weak personalities, but they're not psychopaths, <laughs> even though they participated in psychopathic activity. Right. You know, right. I'm I'm just over here thinking about it was like two days ago. I went into the living room. I was walking. Actually, my, it's kind of like an open concept in my house. I was in the kitchen, but I can see down into the living room. Oh my and my two year old, two and a half, he'll be three in November. 
Okay, we have a big dog bed. He was laying very still, <laughs> eyes closed on the dog bed, on his back. Happened to be naked. We're potty training, laying there. And I was like, buddy, what are you doing? He opened one eye. I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's practicing, okay. man. He's got to see how it feels. <laughs> Oh God. oh, God. I blame his big brother, but <laughs> I'll Which, keep an eye on that one. He's ex- very charming. <laughs> exactly. It's like one of the two of them is probably the ringleader in this scenario. We'll have to wait till they're eight, nine, or ten years old to know which, oh, which is I'm which. I'm so scared. I'm so scared. Well, don't worry. There's a chance of rehabilitation. So, okay, good. Um, so if they commit the transgression alone, this reflects an interior impulse toward harm. Criminal versatility, committing of different types of crimes in different settings can also hint at future psychopathy. We have a fairly good idea of what an adult psychopathic brain looks like, thanks in part to Keel's work. He has scanned the brains of hundreds of inmates at maximum security prisons and chronicled the neural differences between average violent convicts and psychopaths. Oh, is he the one that found out he was a psychopath? Oh, I don't know. This article you know, didn't go into it. Yeah, I know what you're talking, what I'm about. talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The big doctor who's studying it and does uh, a scan of his own shit. brain. Realized he was a psychopath. Probably was. Good yeah. question. So broadly speaking, Keel and others believe that the psychopathic brain has at least two neural abnormalities and that these same differences likely also occur in the brains of callous children. Mm. The first abnormality appears in the limbic system, the set of brain structures involving in, among other things, processing emotions. In a psychopath's brain, this area contains less gray matter. Quote, it's like a weaker muscle, Keel says. A psychopath may understand intellectually that what he's doing is wrong, but he doesn't feel it. Psychopaths know the words, but not the music, is how Keel describes it. They just don't have the same circuitry. Mm-hmm. Psychopaths not only fail to recognize distress in others, they may not feel it themselves. The best psychological indicator of which young people will become violent criminals as adults is a low resting heart rate, says Adrian Rain of the University of Pennsylvania. Really? Yeah. Longitudinal studies that followed thousands of men in Sweden, the UK, and Brazil all point to this biological anomaly. Quote, we think that low heart rate reflects a lack of fear, and a lack of fear could predispose someone to committing fearless criminal violence acts, Rain oh, says. Uh, uh-huh. I'm go get a pulse ox right now. <laughs> I know. Well, and I've thought about that a lot. I've thought about, you know, when people are committing these crimes, if they are afraid of anything. And, right. You know, I'm assuming that they're not, and it turns out they actually aren't. Yeah. The second hallmark of psychopathic brain is an overactive reward system, especially primed for drugs, sex, and anything else that delivers a ping of excitement. In one study, children played a computer gambling game programmed to allow them to win early on and then slowly begin to lose. Most people will cut their losses at some point, Kent Keel notes, quote, whereas the psychopathic, callous, unemotional kids keep going until they lose everything. Their breaks don't work, he says. Mm. Researchers see this insensitivity to punishment even in some toddlers, as Sadie has pointed out in her (laughs) own home. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Quote, these are the kids that are completely unperturbed by the fact that they've been put in timeout, says Eva Kimonis, who works with callous children and their families at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Quote, so it's not surprising that they keep going back to timeout because it's not effective for them, whereas reward... They're very motivated by that. Mm. Okay, well, good. Both of my boys hate timeouts. So that's good. <laughs> there you go. Good. <laughs> this insight is driving a new wave of treatment. What's a clinician to do if the emotional, empathetic part of a child's brain is broken, but the reward part of the brain is humming along? Quote, you co-opt the system, Keel says. You work with what's left. Mandata Juvenile Treatment Center near Madison, Wisconsin, was developed, quote, in response to a nationwide epidemic of youth violence in the early 90s. Instead of placing young offenders in juvenile prison until they were released to commit more and more violent crime as adults, the Wisconsin legislature set up a new treatment center to break the cycle of pathology. Caldwell and Van Rybowick, who opened the facility in 1995, 
tell me that the state's high security juvenile corrections facility was supposed to send over its most mentally ill boys between the ages of 12 and 17. It did, but what Caldwell and Van Rybroek didn't anticipate was that the boys the facility transferred were also its most menacing. They recall their first few assessments, quote, the kid would walk out and we would turn and look at each other and say, that's the most dangerous person I've ever seen in my life, Caldwell oh, says. Oh, God. <laughs> Each one seemed more threatening than the last. Jesus. <laughs> Quote, we were looking at each other and saying, oh, no, what have we done? <laughs> Van Vrybroek adds, what they have done by trial and error is achieve something most people thought impossible. If they haven't cured psychopathy, they've at least tamed it. Wow. Yeah. Many of the teenagers at Mendota grow up on the streets without parents and were beaten up or sexually abused. Violence became a defense mechanism. Caldwell and Van Rybroek recall a group therapy session a few years ago in which one boy described being strung up by his wrists and hung from the ceiling as his father cut him with a knife and rubbed pepper in the wounds. Oh. Quote, hey, several other kids said, that's like what happened to me. What? They call themselves the, quote, pinata club. Oh, my God. Yes. I feel so... Dizzy? <laughs> well, and um, sheltered. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Whoa. I know, that's Whoa. the thing. It's like you and I have listened to every true crime podcast of all time, and I'm still just absolutely <sighs> fucking flabbergasted by what goes on in this world. Yeah. So... we Yeah. So not everyone in Mandata was born in hell, quote, born in hell, as Van Rybroek puts it. Some of the boys were raised in middle-class homes with parents whose major sin was not abuse, but paralysis in the face of their terrifying child. No matter the history, one secret to diverting them from adult psychopathy is to wage an unrelenting war of presence. At Mandata, the staff calls this, quote, decompression. The idea is to allow a young man who has been living in a state of chaos to slowly rise to the surface and acclimate to the world without resorting to violence. Caldwell mentions that two weeks ago, one patient became furious over some perceived slight or injustice. Every time the text checked on him, he would squirt urine or feces through the door. In parentheses, this is a popular pastime at Mandata. Mm -hmm. The text would dodge it and return 20 minutes later, and he would do it again. Quote, this went on for several days, Caldwell says. Wow. Yep. But part of the concept of decompression is that the kid's going to get tired at some point. And one of those times you're going to come there and he's going to be tired or he's just not going to have any urine left to throw at you. And you're going to have a little moment where you're going to have a positive connection there. Forming attachments with callous kids is important, but it's not Mandata's singular insight. The center's real breakthrough involves deploying the anomalies of the psychopathic brain to one's advantage, specifically downplaying punishment, and dangling rewards. These boys have been expelled from school, placed in group homes, arrested, and jailed. If punishment were going to rein them in, it would have by now. But their brains do respond enthusiastically to rewards. At Mendata, the boys can accumulate points to join ever more prestigious, quote, clubs. Club 19, Club 23, the VIP club. As they ascend in status, they earn privileges and treats, candy bars, baseball cards, pizza on Saturdays, the chance to play Xbox or stay up late. Hitting someone, throwing urine, or cussing out the staff costs the boys points, but not for long, since callous and unemotional kids aren't generally deterred by punishment. In fact, the program at Mandata has changed the trajectory for many young men, at least in the short term. Caldwell and Van Rybroek have tracked the public records of 248 juvenile delinquents after their release. 147 of them have been in a juvenile corrections facility, and 101 of them, the harder, more psychopathic cases, had received treatment at Mandata. In the four and a half years since their release, the Mandata boys have been far less likely to reoffend, 64% versus 97%. Wow. I know and wow. far less likely to commit a violent crime, 36 versus 60%. Wow. Most striking, the ordinary delinquents have killed 16 people since their release. The boys from Mandata, not one. Wow. Quote, we thought as soon as they walked out the door, they'd maybe last a week or two, and they'd have another felony on their record, Caldwell says. 
And when the data first came back that showed that wasn't happening, we figured there was something wrong with the data. For two years, they tried to find mistakes or alternative explanations, but eventually they concluded that the results were real. No one believes that Mandata graduates will develop true empathy or a heartfelt moral conscience. Quote, they may not go from the Joker and the Dark Knight to Mr. Rogers, Caldwell tells me laughing, <laughs> but they can develop a cognitive moral conscience, an intellectual awareness that life will be more rewarding if they play by the rules. We're just happy to, if they stay on the side of the law, Van Rybroek says. In our world, that's huge. Yeah. Wow. So... That is the story of the torture and murder of sweet Shonda Sharer and a tiny little nugget of hope mm -hmm. that if under intense care and treatment, there is hope for young psychopaths in this world. That's fascinating. Right? Everybody needs to train therapy dogs. Everybody needs some therapy themselves. Yes. Everyone needs some therapy, <laughs> therapy themselves. And if your kid is strangling your other children uh, and drawing murder books, timeout won't work. They probably need to be institutionalized so that they can learn how to... Essentially, it sounds like they are learning how to correlate being good in the world with this positive reward system, right? right so right. Just sort of if retrain their no brain. Empathy. Right. Center. Yeah. Right. So it's like... If you do something bad, something bad will happen to you. Doesn't work. But if you don't do something bad, something good will likely happen to you. Does work. Right. Which is so interesting. So interesting. Yeah. Huh. I know. Kind of fucked up. And I'm like, oh, it still makes me feel really scared of those <laughs> yeah. kids. Yeah. But at least they're making progress. Wow. I know. Wow. I know. Thanks for that. I mean, so, so fucked up. <laughs> You're welcome for it. <laughs> Uh, oh boy i just can't i just can't get enough of child killers i don't yeah man i, I don't hear, yeah. know why I, I mean i do know why it's because it's just like how is that fucking possible right and i'm really surprised we haven't heard more about those girls like you'd never heard of them right her name is familiar but it's hard to know why right i, I can't say that it's super familiar no sometimes yeah. if i if i saw their pictures when i go to look at at their pictures that might ring a bell but mm, probably no, not i don't because they look like every <laughs> girl honestly um hope the one of the lesser evils right looks so much like me at her age interesting and we are yeah. the same age like those girls and i are uh shonda and i are the exact or would be the exact same age but yeah like kind of permed side right. part glasses right. you know well they were born the same time as us more or less um what year did it happen 1990 yeah 1991 okay so yeah we were little i was 11 yeah you were yeah eight so probably one of the reasons why it wasn't more i don't think our parents were like telling us the bedtime story <laughs> right but i would just assume that this would be one of those stories that you hear like the menendez yeah. brothers or something you right. know something you hear about mm -hmm. forever because it's so shocking and bizarre mm -hmm. i know it was a huge case i mean they mentioned i got most of this information from the lifetime show killer kids episode mm -hmm. jealousy in which they use some of the most fascinating wigs I have ever seen on television. <laughs> tell you some of those shows. I swear to God. It's like, uh, you need a new wig department. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a huge case, I think, at the time. But it's just, I'm yeah. just so surprised that it hasn't made it into, like, overall lore of psychopaths and killers and, of all time. Right. That's interesting. Fucked up shit. <laughs> yeah. So... Well, I'm going to keep an eye on my youngest. That's what I'm thinking. No. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, that kid. He's so cute. He's so uh, naughty. And like the best kind of naughty yeah. where he gets away with it because it's adorable and hilarious. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know the truth. Got a full, what's the guy's name? Patrick Bateman. Got a real Patrick Bateman <laughs> on your hands. Thanks. He's uh... like, Mommy, I want to eat it. Stasia or whatever that restaurant was called in the show. <laughs> the spas, though. I can't remember. God damn it. What's it called? I gotta look it up now. Uh, yeah, her poor family, her poor everybody. Yeah, it's so, so. It's so awful. sad. Her poor father, her poor mom. I hope her mom's just living in relative peace now. Seriously. Sounds like she found yeah. some solace. 
So there you go, guys. There you go. Another one in the books. The loudest truck in the history of the world. I know. I've got, I've got scream birds. I've got <laughs> party chipmunks and giant trucks. There was also construction going on next door, but they've quieted down. Well, do we have any businesses? Well, I just want to talk briefly about the fact that the K-pop kids like took over... <laughs> The Tulsa rally. I mean, it's like... Uh, I, it's so amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> and the thing that I find is amazing, because I don't necessarily... You know, I like... I love the idea that everybody's doing their thing right now, right? right. And that mm-hmm. just inspires the absolute well, living shit say. out of me. Yeah. yeah. They're engaged. Yes. They're engaged. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I know. I, went, I saw my my grandma 95 our our grandmother 95 years old this morning and uh went by to to say hi and i told her about it and she's very in like she's all up to date on politics and yes. not a fan of the trump administration no so i told her what happened and her, her face she got like all crinkly and like smiley and she was like are you kidding and i said no that's what they're saying happened she, she was smacking her knee she just <laughs> Uh, she brought her some joy. That's so <laughs> cute. Grandma is so in favor of the protests, by the way. Any of yeah. you out there organizing and in, yeah. in the streets, Grandma Eck is a hundred percent behind this whole movement. Yeah, that, yeah. It's it's like I said before. I really hope Gen Z and Millennials are going to save the world. And guys, it's like, what are Keep they doing? Up. They're so lazy. And it's like, no, they've just been quietly like saving the world on their phones for the last 15 years <laughs> so serious you know so what true. i mean it's yep. incredible yep. and that's not all that you guys are doing clearly your little right. sweet sweet asses are out in the streets like doing things that other generations could only dream of but i love that shit me too and it's just further motivation for me to continue to do whatever little things i can to help make the world a better place you know, and no matter where you fall on the spectrum of what's going on in this world, I think that, you know, there are plenty of things that we can do to be more responsible and to make better choices, like these tiny little choices that make a huge impact, like even just shopping on Amazon less and shit like that, you know, right? certain people having too much money is a big part of the problem that just sort of branches out into everything. So if you're looking for a way to make a difference... <laughs> There's like endless opportunities. There's just endless opportunities yeah. to be to be better and do good things and support good causes. And thank you to predominantly eleven to thirteen year old. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not all the people that are in the K pop the K pop stands, but thank you guys for yeah. inspiring us old folks. That's right. Definitely getting old. What's K pop? <laughs> Well, that's I'm I'm over here like tapping on my legs like I'm typing in my computer. <laughs> well, I did. Laura and I were driving to my father in law's yesterday for Father's Day, and we did pull up an article about it. So I was like, "What? Are, you know, what is? I of course I know about K-pop, and I know the fan base is massive, but I didn't understand that it is just by nature a very organized, engaged group of individuals across the world that they. They're, like I think it was BTS, you know, one of the top K-pop groups, mm-hmm. has a team of seven people who work in every time zone. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, their team is engaging with fans online wow. through social media. Yep. We need that. I know. I know. I seriously, as I was reading, I was like, maybe could we find some interns or something? If anybody wants to intern for us and get us, yeah, bring us to K-pop status. Teach us about Twitter. Yeah. Totally. Or anything really for that matter. Yeah, right. But they, um... <laughs> So the whole, like, there's this, and I'm going to misquote, so please, anybody who's listening who's, like, slapping their face right now, this is just based on one article that I read yesterday, but there's this whole idea behind the K-pop movement of the kind of, like, ideal person, and part of that is, like, working really hard, you know, being healthy, looking attractive, being good people, taking care of each other, and so they build these communities that are hyper-engaged, and they can essentially sort of control the charts because there's so many of them they have their influence is 14,000 times stronger than your average pop star including like Justin Bieber Taylor Swift so they have 14,000 times the engagement yes so it's like 
Taylor Swift will get like 34,000 mentions on Twitter over a weekend. A K-pop group will get 26 million or 34 oh million. I, it's, I had no idea. I know. That. I know. It's remarkable. Wow. So they're also super philanthropic. And like, you know, at one point they raised $1.4 million for UNICEF. Just. Holy shit. Yeah. So they've been doing these things forever. You know, they're very used to it. It's a part of the culture being a K-pop fan. So, so no wonder they took down the rally. Yeah. It's that like, was like nothing. <laughs> it was uh, seriously. All they have to do is be like, this is what we're doing this weekend. And they're like, done. <laughs> wow. Yep. Yep. All right. We got a new goal. <laughs> <laughs> they will kill K-pop status. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they will kill against bullies. That's right. You guys. <laughs> I don't really care uh, what you believe as long as you don't then leverage your beliefs yes. to bully other people. I Absolutely. fucking hate bullies. You yep. know, like you can yep. believe all kinds of things as long as it doesn't take others down. Yeah. 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 Either overtly or covertly. I don't like mm-hmm. either of those mm-hmm. things, mm-hmm. but no. um, our Wowzers. fans are not those people. Oh, we did get shadow banned on Instagram. That's what we can <laughs> talk about. Yeah. So if you're not seeing our stuff. Go find it. It's there. It's there. Sadie knows more about it, but basically we posted a couple of things for Black Lives Matter. One of them was the post about Tamla Horsford. We just shared, you know, someone else's post. And then there was another one that both got like went sort of like super mini viral, but but viral for us. So getting like a thousand likes and multiple shares and saves and things. And so the algorithm recognized us as bots as a result. Yep. And so you probably haven't seen us so much on the Instagram, but we're still there. So I don't know if it feels cool to get shadow banned. It kind of sucks because we miss you guys. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, go to our page, like some stuff, bring us back around. I think it's, a, I, we were saying, I think it's kind of over now. It does it seem like, like it. People seem to be inter- engaging again. So, yeah. Yeah. So hopefully we're out of the shadow, but yep. whatever. Yep. We're still here. Yep. That's the, the bottom line. Uh, you can find, I'm going to try this. Let's see if I can do it right. I believe in you. If you want to hang out with us on social media, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at they will kill. Yes. You can email us at they will kill podcast at gmail.com. Yep. Go find us at our website. They will kill.com. Yep. Thank you. AJ Bergantz for our music. He does have a new album coming out. We will post about that on yep. our social media rate review subscribe please please and remember I get, i'm just don't discount anybody don't judge other people man because everybody's talking shit about millennials and gen z and then guess what they're probably going to save our asses they're probably going to keep this planet from burning on fire and mm-hmm. keep people safe and teach us all how to be better citizens and communities of a global world and (laughs) (laughs) they're gonna bring the action items up front make them happen yes really fast without all of us oldies having any idea it was happening totally (laughs) meanwhile i'm like i i can't donate on my phone so i gotta go plug in my laptop and they're like i i want a scone recipe where do i I, (laughs) where do i go the google think yeah seriously pull out my cookbook i still use cookbooks like I gave a cookbook to a friend, a friend's daughter who was traveling through on her way to university. And she's vegan, and I've had these vegan cookbooks from college because when we were in college, like they, you know, you didn't. There just wasn't vegan recipes anywhere, so these things mm-hmm. were like gold. And I was like, I don't. If you don't want these, please, like it's fine. She very politely took them. Lucia, I don't know if you're listening to this podcast, but you. You don't have to keep those cookbooks. (laughs) (laughs) Vegan recipes abound on the internet. (laughs) Exactly. It's kind of nice to break out a cookbook every once in a while, but then it's like flopping over. You got to hold it down with Mm -hmm. something. It's disgusting because you've got Mm -hmm. shit all over it for all these years, but it is still kind of charming, I guess, to bust out a cookbook. (laughs) And remember... Throw out your cookbooks if you don't want them. Yeah. There's the internet, guys. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck books. Just kidding. Don't. I love books. Uh, and I love you love guys. You. Very yeah. much. Very much. Thank you for listening. We're almost to 20,000 downloads. Yeah. Like, probably. Very soon. Maybe by the end of today. By the time you listen to this, we'll definitely be at 20,000 downloads. <laughs> Except for nobody's listening anymore. <laughs> so we got shadow banned. Oh.
Just kidding. Uh-huh. You're still listening somehow, so that's that's a positive. <laughs> All right. Love you guys. Love you. Goodbye. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Goodbye.